Gospel hymn and songs number 21. Will your anchor hold? Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cable spin? Will your anchor drift or firm remain? It is safely more will the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand. And the cables passed from his heart to mine can defy the blast through strength divine. It will firmly hold in the straits of fear when the breakers have told the reef is near, though the tempest rave and the wild wings blow, not an angry wave shall our back overflow. It will surely hold in the floods of death, when the waters cold shields our latest breath. On the rising tide, it can never fail, while our hopes abide within the veil. When our eyes behold through the gathering night, the city of gold, our harbor bright, we shall anchor fast by the heavenly shore, with the storms all pass forevermore. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fasting to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Oh, the 
that keeps our soul. So open your mouth and begin to talk to the Lord this morning. Whatever storm, whatever problem, whatever challenge you are passing through this morning, everything before the Sunday message today, we shall have a brief period of scripture reading. The Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. Acts 14. Acts 14. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were ware of it, and fled into Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. 
Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good, and gave us rain from heaven, and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, and to Iconium and Antioch confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Atalia and thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And there they abode long time with the disciples. Acts 15 and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying, that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, Hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. 
then pleased at the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your soul, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen. Yes, we should pity the man in this world who must use the earth for a bed. And I guess we should pity the man who must toil from dawn till dust falls bread. 
But this can be rich if they have contentment and sharing for salvation plan. But if you know any who don't, they have plenty. I must then pity the man. And he knows not the giver of life. Traveler or merchant or builder who builds all the sand. Pauper or king to be saved is a thing. If it's lost, then it's a man. I guess there are those who pity the saved as though they were missing life's best. Forgetting the treasures of earth pass away and that heaven's the place to invest. Oh, meanwhile, I see me, the man who is scheming to hold up the wealth that he can. But if while he's living to God is not giving his soul, then pity the man. The giver of life, traveler, romantic, a builder who build all the sand. Papa Rocking to be saved is the thing. Lost can pity the man. Giver of life, Amen. We want to offer our tithe and offering now. Tithe is one tenth of our gross income as salary announced, and ten one tenth of our profit as businessmen and women. In Malachi chapter three and in verse ten, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. 
and prove me now herewith, say the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be no room to receive it. We want to raise up whatever we have brought to the Lord as we pray over them now. Father, we want to appreciate you for ever providing for each and every one of us. Out of the much you have given, this token has been brought to you tonight. We pray you will accept them from our hands. And in return, Lord God Almighty, you will bless all your people. We thank you, Lord, because you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Please, we can drop our offerings in the bags that have been passed around. been working great miracles in the life of people present physically in the program and uh, those who are connecting through satellite through internet through zoom and social media the Lord has been glorifying his name and we want to listen to uh, some of these testimonies like I told you at the end of this program don't be in a hurry to go stay back and we shall rejoice together the first testifier praise the Lord Praise the Lord! By the special grace of God, my name is Sister Rachel Ahmed from Abuja region, Itako Group, Palace District. I want to thank the name of the Lord for what God has done for me yesterday. Since 2013, I have a very painful, I have a pain in my stomach. And uh, that pain is as a result of I felt sick. I went to the hospital, they checked, they said there's nothing there, but there's, the pain is still there. After the scan, they did everything, no solution, but the brethren prayed. Praise the Lord. So I was delivered, I was healed, but the pain is still there. I see there's a sore, an injury at the right side of my stomach. When the pain starts, I can't lift up my right leg. In fact, it will be paining me as if I, the leg wants to paralyze. So I'll be managing it, praying to God that God, one day you do it. And uh, yesterday, at work, the pain comes up. When the pain comes up, I can't stand to, car to carry anything from the ground. I can't bend to pick something easily. But I told God, I said, God, this time, this pain come at the wrong time. And uh, as I step, we step my foot to this place, I will not go back with the pain. I came here yesterday, I was praying to God with the pain, praying, telling God that God, remember me. And I was our father, and the Lord climbed the pulpit, he said, he's talking to you in particular. I claim it. I said, God remember me. And I see he was preaching, he prayed. After he, the last amen, praise the Lord. He so she lay her hands to the place where the problem. I laid my hand there. In fact, after the last amen, that's how the pain vanished. Praise the, the vanished. Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And, uh, it's gone and it's gone forever. I in went Jesus on to name. confirm it. Amen. 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 We thank God for what the Lord has done for our sister. The pain is gone and it's never coming back in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister, tell us your name briefly and uh, be very brief. Praise the Lord. Praise the Master Jesus. My name is Ngozi Mwezi. I, I am from Abuja region in Jai Group, Deepa Life High School, Kadokam Grand. I want to testify what God has done in my life. Since 2007, I worked for King's Care Hospital. They did their straight my leg, very painful, swallowed up. 
And they did the test, they say it's arthritis. I said, what caused the arthritis for me now? They say that is uh, maybe old age. I said, okay. So I'll be praying, say, God, help me, remember me, you are the one who created me. As I pray like that, I go to, it's on PRA, but I, if I have enemy, I will not allow enemy to suffer what I suffer for this pain. It's very painful. It's itching me inside, walking up on my body, that if it's not on for me, I cry for another sister, I cry for another, but they direct me, I go to Matama. All this thing, we, 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 I try my own, as Please tell woman, us what the but, Lord has done, sister. But uh, through the ministration of the man of God had, as he praying, say, uh, everything concerning all that, uh, for our body, I uh, leg everything as uh, we pray like that. And the God Almighty uses the power to uh, touch me and every pain in my body, every problem come and vanish. Every Praise pain, the Lord. Every problem has vanished. Praise the Lord. And it's gone never to come back in Jesus' name. Amen. We move to the media section. Two minutes. Please give us some of the testimonies. We have some testimonies from the social media. From Yaya region, Sister Ladi Ogoi used to have pains on her right hand, right leg. And that happened for a long time. She said, after the GS prayer, last night, the pains suddenly disappeared. And now, she can stretch her hand and her leg, and there is no pain at all. Praise the Lord. Testimony from Tasha Group, Guagua Region. Brother Samuel Danladi was healed of kidney infection. According to the writing, the problem started since November 2016. And he has visited several hospitals to find solution to the problem. But all efforts proved abortive. After the prayer of the man of God on the first day of the crusade, he touched himself. He searched himself. He went back to check and found out that the kidney infection had totally disappeared. According to his writing, he is perfectly healed and all the symptoms have gone away. Also from the social media, Amaka Chika Ede came back home with heavy pain all over her body. But when he heard that our father in the faith was coming, she decided to trust God right on the social media. During the prayers, she believed God and she said after the prayers, she checked and the pain is gone. She says she's perfectly okay now. And God has healed her. Njoku David says, Almighty God healed me. I had a back pain that lasted for almost one year after the prayer of the man of God. I am now totally healed. Praise the Lord. Striking testimony from Taraba State. Mama Usman Audu from Bailey region in Taraba State was a blind woman. She was invited to the crusade on Friday night, that's yesterday, after the prayers of the man of God, Pastor Dr. W.F. Kumui. She believed God and she trusted God and started to wait for her eyes to be opened. Suddenly, according to her writing, her eyes instantaneously got opened. Brethren, Sister Mama Usman Audu can now see clearly praise the lord finally from ebuka fabian he says i had waist pain excruciating waist pain after the prayer of the man of god the waist pain totally disappeared praise the lord hallelujah put your hands together for jesus give jesus a clap of Headquarters Church said, yeah. I welcome everyone to our Bible study tonight. It's always a joy when we come together and we learn together, and the power of the word works in every life. It will work more in your life. Yeah. It's working already. Say it's working already. 
to work more in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to remind you once again, all these empty seats down here, down there, I want to fill them up every Monday. Monday Bible study is our Bible school. I mean Bible school for all the members. And we go from chapter to chapter, verse to verse, and book to book. And by the time you come a number of times, you'll be a preacher yourself. It may be better. Amen. You know, as I get older, I want to go through thoroughly what we have in the Bible so that as um, I don't mean I'm going now, not time yet. I said it's not time yet. But as things are going on, I'll be finding a brother there, sister there, and I might even uh, try and sit down here and say, Today you will teach. You will do it. Father, we thank you today and we bless your name for calling us into this solemn assembly to read your word, to learn your word, and to be impacted by your word. I'm asking, O oh Lord, that you touch every heart today and make us the man, the woman, the brother, the, the sister, the minister we ought to be in Jesus' name. And we pray that your word will not fall on the ground. It will fall in the fertile ground of our hearts in Jesus' name. Lift up your people. Give us more understanding that will go forth and do the work you've called us to do in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God bless you. Your amen looks very good. You want to say another amen? Yeah. We're coming to James chapter 1 and we're reading from verse 13. James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Verse 15, it says, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Verse 16, it says, Be, uh, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Tonight, we're looking at uh, the study under this title, Believer's Vigilance and Victory Over Temptation. Temptation, temptation will come. Temptation is there. There's a devil in the world, and there are spirits in the world, and there are men and women in the world that would like to tempt the believer to sin in. Therefore, we need to understand how do we overcome? How do we triumph? How do we have the victory? The believer's vigilance and victory over temptation. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, revelation of the source and the violation of temptation. Temptation violates people, violates their right, violates their peace of mind, and violates their, their decision. They want to go this direction in the right direction. And here comes the tempter with his temptation to violate them. And we need to know the source of such violation. Number two, the ruinousness. That is when, when something ruins and destroys and scatters somebody's life. The ruinousness of succumbing voluntarily to temptation. Number three, resources for the saints victory over temptation. Saints victory over temptation. Young or old, we're connected with the Lord and we have the salvation of our soul and that connection is still there. That conversion is still valid. We are the saints of God. We're going to overcome. 
If you were defeated in the past, the days of victory, they have come for you. They have come for me. Looks like you are not excited tonight. The kind of amen you are giving is like amen. Let's look at number one. Number one, revelation of the source and violation of temptation. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the regrettable statement on the temptation of the subjects. The subjects are the citizens in the kingdom and they are the subject of the king of kings and the lord of lords and for anyone to say i'm being tempted of god that is a regrettable statement number two revealed source of temptation to sin when god tests us that's not temptation that's just testing to test to understand to to bring out our strength our value and to bring out our consecration he can test us even though the word the old english word uh, from king james version might say that god did tempt abraham really he tested abraham to know his consecration and to know his mind of following him but when it comes to tempting to sin in the work of the devil the revealed source of temptation to sin number three the root and the root that is the second root there is the pathway is the is the is the road that uh, from temptation to sinfulness let's look at number one number one the regrettable statement on the temptation of subjects we're looking at james chapter one reading from verse 13. james 1 Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. That's the regrettable statement that anyone can say that God is tempting him or tempting her to sin. He loves everyone. How would you tempt? How will you destroy the person you love? He gave Jesus Christ for us that he might set us free from sin. How will he at the same time tempt us to sin? And he has said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And he's not willing that anyone should die, but that all should come to repentance. I will, I will the God of love and the God of life, how will he then tempt us to evil? It's a regrettable statement that anybody can make that God is tempting him. That's why the Bible says let no man no man here, no man there no man in the past generation no man in the present generation, no man even in the world, God does not tempt them if he's going to judge them for their sin. How will he at the same time tempt them to commit sin in the world in the church, among the young, among the old, anyone, anywhere it is not God that tempts us it says let no man say when he is tempted I am tempted of God for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man, we are looking at uh, Genesis chapter 3 Genesis chapter 3 we are looking at verse 11 and he said who told thee that thou wast naked as thou eating of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou should not eat? Look at verse 12. It said, The man, and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest me to be with me, she gave me of the tree. And I did eat. It's not God that brought the temptation. And, it's, and God did not create Eve, make her the wife of Adam so that she can, he can fall. No, I will make him and help meet for him. The purpose of God, the intention of God is that the wife will help the man 
keep the man protect the man and will sustain the man with all the grace and all the strength that she could have but the serpent came satan came and tempted eve and eve succumbed and satan put it in the heart of eve to also give to the husband that is how the temptation how the thing came in isaiah chapter 63 reading from verse 17 it says O lord why hast thou made us to err from thy ways that the wrong statement of those people once again they said god you made us err you made us go astray you made us do evil you made us depart from your way how can god do that god has said stand ye in the ways and ask and know where is the good way the old way and walk ye in it the same god that calls us to walk in the right way how can he then lead us astray out of the way it's a misstatement a regrettable statement by anyone the subjects of the king of kings to say you made us err from thy ways and you hardened our heart from thy fear god doesn't harden anybody's heart he is the one that actually takes away the stony heart and he gives all the heart of flesh and the same god that calls us and he says i will cleanse you i will wash you from all your filthiness and i will take the stony heart out of your flesh and give you the heart of flesh that same god cannot contradict himself and make our heart hard towards him return for thy servant's sake and the tribes of thine inheritance and so we understand god does not tempt us if temptation comes it's coming from satan and if it ever comes to you you'll overcome in jesus name in job chapter 31 reading from verse 33 if i covered my transgressions as adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom and job is telling us that actually what happened to adam is that he was covering up he was giving excuse and that excuse did not stand and job said i will not do that i will not accuse god that is the one tempting me look at number two here number two we're looking at the revealed source of temptation to sin we need to know who is the personality that actually tempts people to sin in in luke chapter 4 reading from verse 2 luke chapter 4 verse 2 being 40 days tempted of the devil you see that the father did not tempt the son god in heaven did not tempt jesus his only begotten son the holy ghost did not tempt uh, the son of god jesus christ it was the devil because christ came to this world to save he came to this world so that he will recover the kingdom from the devil and that's what god sent him for and he said i want to do your will lo i am here look i come to do your will the same god that wants him to do the will of the heavenly father cannot tempt him not to do it it says uh, 40 days he was tempted of the devil and in those days he did eat nothing and when they were ended he afterward hunger look at verse 3 in verse 3 it says and the devil said unto him if thou be the son of god command this stone that it be made bread very clear is the devil that tempts whenever you have any temptation is the devil that brings the temptation and he has a goal he wants you to fall 
He wants you to compromise. He wants you to sin so that as see as a means heaven. And he knows it's not going to heaven. And he knows it's a short time. It will soon be in hell. He says, I don't want to be there alone. He wants to gather all the sons and, and, the, and the daughters of men. He wants to gather them with him. I will not go with him. First Chronicles chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 1. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Again, we're told it's Satan, it's the devil. It's Lucifer, it's the adversary, it's the accuser of the brethren that does that. Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Underline that word, provoke. When there is you know, something happening and uh, you know that thing rubs the wrong direction with you. And there is a uh, fuming from within. And there is some um, anger from within. And there is uprising from within. And it's like you should rise up and go and do something wrong. It may be something of the flesh. It may be something like fighting. It may be like confrontation. Whatever it is that something is rising up in you. As if get up, get up, get up. And go and confront them. That's provocation. Please remember that provocation is of the devil and that provocation is of satan you will not obey satan i will not obey satan look at acts of the apostle chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 3 acts chapter 5 verse 3 peter said ananias why has satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land when there is a tendency to tell a lie, to deceive, and to pretend as if this is that, but you know it is wrong. And between his house and the sanctuary where Peter was all through that land, the thing was telling him, tell him, tell him, tell him the lie, deceive him. And then they say they have gifts of the spirit and the word of knowledge. Go and test them whether they will say, Praise the Lord, you brought this large amount. Now, the devil knew that Peter, the apostle, had the gift of the word of knowledge. And that Peter will know. But he wanted to destroy Ananias. I wanted to destroy Sapphira, the, the wife. That's the reason why all the time was going from his house. He was going to the sanctuary, to the temple, or wherever, to meet Peter. The devil kept on whispering, remember, remember, uh, you need to have a real recognition. And eventually Peter said, Ananias, why? At this time of revival, why? At this time when the Holy Ghost came up and he is really baptizing people and feeling people and were being revived, why? At such a time like this, healing is taking place, deliverance is taking place, and the power of the Lord moving in a way we've never seen before. Why is it at this time Satan? Filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price. Look at verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Was it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. You have not lied unto man, but you have lied unto God. That, 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 that the trick of the devil, he says, is an ordinary man. The man like yourself, what's his name? Peter. Go and tell him, are you fearing Peter? 
Are you fearing a special appearance? Is he not a man like yourself? No. You have not lied unto man. But you have lied unto God. The devil will make people to think he's just a man. Call him pastor. He's just a man. Call him apostle. He's just a man. Call him director. He's just a man. And the devil will say it doesn't matter. Lying to an ordinary man. And they will give them a reason for telling the lie. But Peter set him straight and said, No, you are not lying to me. You are lying unto God. And you know what happened? He died right there. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 5. We're being told by the scriptures very clearly that Satan is the source of temptation to sin. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 5, defraud ye not one the other. I want you to underline that word defraud. When somebody practices fraud, and he cheats the other person in business. And he tries to do 419. And he tries to get money out of another person by craft, by cunning method. They call it fraud. And if he does it, he's accused of defrauding another person. Now he's talking about husband and wife. And he is uh, saying, defraud ye not one the other. That he is uh, the, uh, the husband has a right to the wife. The wife has a right to the husband. And when, you know, the, the wife is always saying, I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm feeling sleepy. I'm just, I don't know, maybe I'm even sick. You will not be sick in Jesus' name. And then you deny your husband. Or oh, it's the husband denying the wife that she, you know, at this, uh, at this age now, I think you should understand that the body is no more as fresh as it used to be. And he's always giving excuse and he's pushing the woman to go out and do whatever and if the woman does that she yields to temptation and and then if the woman comes to say my husband look at what i did uh -huh, we're going to tell the pastor we're good but you are the one that pushed her out the word of god is saying very clearly defraud ye not one the other except it be with consent for a time that she may give yourselves to fasting and to prayer and come together again and come together again that satan Tempt you not. Temptation is the work of Satan. Satan will not get you. Satan will not get me. It says so that Satan tempts you not for your incontinency. That is for your uh, inconsistency. And you are going apart, apart, and apart. And you are more familiar with men outside than you are familiar with your husband. When those men, when they call you outside and you talk, talk, and talk, that time you are not tired. That time you are not weak. That time you are not sick. It's when your own husband, the closest person to you, and the one the Lord has given you, that you will fulfill God's will with him. That the time you are tired, or maybe it's the man. The man is always tired. He's always tired. Uh, can we be together tonight? I'm sorry. I'm, you know, I'm tired. You know me now. I'm the weaker vessel, but. When other men call you from outside and you talk and talk and talk on the phone and nowadays they even use a Zoom and they see what, and you find the woman laughing, laughing and you say, but this woman said she was tired. No, it's the temptation of the devil. The Lord deliver us from the devil in Jesus' name. He will not get you. I said they will not get you. 
if you're in the habit of you know being pushing your husband away pushing your wife away and you are closer to men outside closer to women outside talk and talk and talk without stopping even even at night at the time you should even you know the, the man calling you from outside should understand the woman calling you from outside should know look at the time I shall release that woman, I shall release that man to be in his family. They don't do that. You're yielding to temptation. The Lord deliver you in Jesus' name. Point number three there. Number three, we're looking at the root. The root of temptation and the root, they call it drought in other places. The drought from temptation to sinfulness we're looking at james chapter one james chapter one i'm reading from verse 14 but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own loss and entice that's the root that's what brings the temptation is drawn away is led away of his own lost and enticed and then in verse 15 it says well, then when lost as conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death we're looking at um, uh, we're looking at that and it says this is how it comes how temptation comes and how people yield and surrender to temptation joshua chapter 7 reading from verse 21 joshua chapter 7 verse 21 when i saw that's where it begins through the eye gauge when i saw among the spoils a goodly babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight then i coveted number one i saw now you can see something accidentally like um, David saw Bathsheba washing herself and she, he saw her nakedness accidentally but now thinking about that what he saw and ruminating on that what he saw and appreciating what he saw and desiring what he saw that is where the problem of temptation begins now in the world in which we live there is so much you are searching for an information on the on the net wikipedia or whatever and all of a sudden something comes up that's accidental you didn't bring that one up but you appreciate that you look at that you gaze at that you think of that and it's really bringing passion and uh, sensuality from your heart and you keep on looking at that now that's beyond just accidentally seeing something or it may be that you know some of uh, these things that come up and uh, you know and you stay there and you're looking into that and you know it is wrong. How do you know it's wrong? If, um, you know, it's in the night and your husband happens to be coming along, you find a way to cleverly cover it up. Now, if it's not sinful, why are you covering it up? And, or if your wife is coming and you say, you know, I don't want this woman to see that because I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, I don't want her to see that this is what I'm watching. And then you cleverly uh, you know stop that close that or well, you deceive him it's no more accidentally you saw and then you coveted and it says and you i took them i saw i coveted and i took and it says behold they are they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and 
the silver and under each as well we're looking at um, hebrews chapter 12 hebrews chapter 3 rather hebrews chapter 3 we're looking at verse 12 it says take each brethren lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Temptation, if you yield to temptation, it makes you to depart from the living God. It tells us in verse 13, in verse 13, but exhort one another and daily while it is called today, let any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14, it says, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Hold the beginning of your faith, of your confidence, of your consecration steadfast unto the end. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, we're looking at the ruinousness of succumbing voluntarily to temptation the ruinousness of succumbing voluntarily nobody is forcing age on you in fact even the phones we use we can control our phone and if you see that something comes in and you know that that source is always sending something to you that will pollute your mind that will defile your mind. You know already that that is what you are going to see if you open it. Can't you shut it up? Can't you block that side and say, I will not yield to that? Or if it's a man, the man is always coming. I'm talking physically now. He's always coming. And you know that whenever he comes, he has something in his lips. It's going to introduce something. It's going to say something. It's going to drag you to something you know, that eventually you might not be able to shake off. He wants to visit you. And every time he visits, you know, if Jesus came at such a time with that pollution, with that defilement, you will miss heaven. Because it says, Thou hast heard, thou shalt not commit adultery. But... If you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed it already in your heart. If you look on a man to lust after him, you've done it already in your heart. And so you understand if a messenger of Satan, if a tempter, if a temptress is coming to you, there's no point saying, what can I do now? Shut your door. Uh, getting to heaven is not child's play. You have to say, here is where I stand. And that is how to overcome. You will overcome. I will overcome. The Lord confirm it to your life in Jesus' name. If you succumb, it brings death. Because it tells us in James chapter 1, reading from verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own laws and enticed. In verse 15, in verse 15 it says, Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin when it is finished. Bring it forth death. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 18, reading from verse 30. Ezekiel 18, verse 30. Therefore, I will, I, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin if you yield it ruins you it destroys you it pulls you away from the kingdom of god and it puts you in the direction of going to that other side where you don't want to go three things we're looking at number one number one spiritual death 
of all who are living and succumbing under temptation. Number two, sad death of the lifestyle of surrendering to temptation. Number three is the second death after a lifetime of yielding to temptation. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at spiritual death of all who live and succumb under temptation. Uh, look at uh, chapter 7 of the Psalms. Psalms chapter 7. And we're reading here from verse 11. It says, God judges the righteous. And God is angry with the wicked every day. Do you know, when you go in the direction of wickedness, yielding to temptation, God is angry with you. You might, you know, call him good names, great names, and praise him. But if you are succumbing to temptation, and you know it is temptation, because it's always dragging you down, or maybe, apart from being temptation to you, that interaction with that other person, is bringing temptation to him or bringing temptation to her. And as you do that, God is angry with the wicked every day. It tells us in verse 14. In verse 14, behold, he traveleth with iniquity and he has conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. We're looking at Isaiah. Chapter 59, and I'm reading from verse 2. But your iniquities have separated you between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. It hinders a prayer because the spiritual death, spiritual death means your soul is separated from God. It means your whole personality is separated from God because of your sin. It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 5, we're looking at verse 6. It says, She that liveth in pleasure is dead, separated from God, while she liveth. She that liveth in pleasure. You understand? Uh, recently, when we spoke about um, about salvation, about justification, we said the salvation from the power of sin, the salvation from the pollution of sin, the salvation from the pleasure of sin. If you derive pleasure, sinful pleasure, fleshly pleasure in what you are doing, you are yielding to the Temptation and it's dead, spiritual dead, because she that liveth in pleasure, the pleasure of the flesh, and the pleasure in your emotion, and the pleasure in your feeling, although other people may not know, but you know that you derive pleasure from that temptation, and you're yielding to that, she or he that liveth in pleasure is dead, separated from God, while she liveth. The Lord purge every one of us completely in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two, sad death for the lifestyle of surrendering to temptation. Sad death. We've read about an answer already. Sad death. Sudden death. We've read about Sapphire the wife. Sad death. Sudden death. And uh, you, uh, you look at Acts chapter 12. In Acts chapter 12, we're reading from verse 21. Acts 12, verse 21. And upon his said day, Herod, a rich in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. Verse 22, in verse 22, and the people gave a shout saying, it is the voice of a God and not of a man. That the temptation, they wanted him to, you know, pump up himself, lift up himself, and they wanted him to accept, you are a God. You are not just a man. And the temptation came and he fell 
for the temptation. Look at the next verse in verse 23. It says, And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he, he gave not God the glory. And he was eating of worms and gave up the ghost. Uh, we're looking at uh, Proverbs chapter 10. Verse 27, it says, The fear of the Lord prolonged days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Because they yield to temptation, yield to temptation. They don't know how to say no to Satan, say no to the devil, say no to the tempter, say no to the temptress. And they cut short their own lives. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. In Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 27, And as it is appointed unto men, wants to die. But after this, the judgment. After this, judgment. When somebody dies here, sad death, that because of the temptation to go, to push, to drive, to move here, to move there, and unfortunately, he destroys his, his himself. He dies suddenly. His sad death is going to face the Lord in eternity. Look at number three. Number three, we're looking at the second death after a lifetime of yielding to temptation. Yielding to temptation. Let me ask you. You say you are born again. You have a lifestyle of yielding to temptation. Do you ever say no to that thing drawing you, dragging you, attracting you? Do you ever say no to that thing that is of the flesh? Do you ever say no to that thing that is weakening you and weakening you no matter how much you pray and no matter how far you go in consecration? When that thing comes, do you ever say no? The people you don't know how to say no and the people who don't check their mind, they don't check their heart and they don't check their propensity to suck in evil. There's going to be spiritual death. There's going to be sad death. And there's going to be the second death after a lifetime of just yielding and yielding and yielding to temptation. And look at uh, the word of God in James chapter 1, reading from verse 15. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Bringeth forth death. In the First Chronicles chapter 10. First Chronicles chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 13. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord which he kept not and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it this was the soul a king when he came to the throne he sought for all the witches and the wizards and all the necromancers and all the people that dealt for familiar spirit and, ex and uh, got them out of the land after a person has so consecrated himself and that everybody knew now he got a problem and he wanted solution and he said go look for me and search for a witch somebody having familiar spirit and when they got this witch of Endor she reminded them you know Saul you know how he drove everyone away you want to endanger my life no Saul had changed it's not the same man of conviction as it was when he came on the throne. Many people like that, they have changed. The things they will not touch. 
many years ago the things they will not taste many years ago the things they will not come near many years ago the things they were run away from many years ago today they befriend them they go along with them and their lives are totally changed like Saul and we're told God then smote him and killed him for his transgression. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. I pray God will preserve our lives, preserve our consecration, that the vomit. That we, have, that we have given up before We don't go back again Like the dog to swallow up A, a vomit anymore In Jesus name Revelation chapter 21 I'm reading from verse 8 Revelation chapter 21 Verse 8 For the fearful The unbelieving The abominable The murderers And the mongers And the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. Please remember that. White lie. All liars. Professional lies. All liars. They were trained in their field. That whenever this happens and your director asks you, tell him a lie. They say it's for the profession. But all liars. Or maybe lying in the family that you know the wife is lying to the husband and the husband is lying to the wife i'm telling him that lie because you know he has hypertension and if i tell him the right thing is his blood pressure will shoot up he might die my sister that's an excuse. If you are going to tell the truth, tell the truth. If you want to get to heaven, those who trade in line and those who kind of the merchandise of line, they will not get to heaven. All liars will have their part in the lake which burns with brimstone. And then there are people, well, this work, there's no work now in the country. And if I tell the management the real truth about this, I will lose my job. If I lose my job, how do I try to get another job? And because of that, they told a lie. They cover that lie with another lie. And when you are about to discover that, they cover it with another lie. You might keep your job. You might not keep the job, even with the line, because God is on the throne. He can still make you to be suspended or to be dismissed, even if you told the line. But the point is, whether you keep the job, you don't keep the job, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There are people that should not go about. All they can do is, I saw you talking to the pastor. I hope you didn't tell him the right thing about that thing we did. And about that thing we're covering up. Please, don't get me to trouble. Never tell the pastor or anybody that can tell him that this is what happened. And you're a liar and you're covering up the lie and you're influencing another person to cover up the lie. But please remember, please remember the fearful, I'm afraid what will happen if I tell the truth and the unbelieving, I don't believe God can protect me if I tell the truth and the abominable, you've done abominable things instead of confessing so that you can be cleansed and you can be washed abominable, you're still into that thing and all murderers and all mongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and with brimstone which is the second death was the second death uh, the final separation from the almighty god all through eternity it is the death of death the death of death in our studies in mathematics when you say d times d 
We say that is D squared. Death of death. You know that word of? When you want to really calculate, you remove that of and you put times. So death of death, death times death, D squared is a second death final. There is no coming back from there. That's the reason why if you're a real child of God, whatever temptation comes, I say no. I say no. And look at verse 27. In verse 27, and there shall in no wise enter into each any sin that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie, or manufactures a lie, or creates a lie, but only they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. We come to point number three now. Point number three, resources for the saints' victory over temptation. The resources we have. The strength we have, the conviction we have, the ability we have so that we overcome temptation. Temptation coming from any direction. Temptation coming from maybe your flesh, maybe your loss, maybe your pride of life, maybe your surrounding, maybe your habit, maybe from other people where we'll have a victory. I will have the victory confirmed in Jesus' name. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, God, a protector and preserver from temptation. Number two, grace, a portion and power over temptation. Number three, godliness through prayer and perseverance against temptation. Look at number one. Number one, God a protector. God a preserver from temptation. In Genesis chapter 20, I'm reading here from verse 3. Genesis chapter 20 verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast, well, hast taken, for she is a man's wife. I, I think you might know the story. Actually, um, Abraham was now getting old and old and old. And uh, Sarah the wife was also old, old, old. But she still looked pretty. And so Abraham told Sarah, anywhere we go, you know, these uh, unbelieving uh, kings, no matter how many women they have to their record, they still want, uh, you know, people like you. So tell him, uh, tell them, uh, you're my sister. It was actually Abraham uh, that planted that lie in uh, Sarah. And uh, so they got together. And they were asking, and Sarah said, I'm his sister. Oh, if you're his sister, I'd like to, you know, get married to you. And she didn't say no. And God had promised that he was going to give the promised son to Abraham and Sarah. And so uh, Abimelech took uh, Sarah now. They had not slept together. He has not touched her. People say, what did I do? Have I touched her? Have I had canon knowledge of her now? Abimelech had not had what you call canon knowledge. But God came to him and said, by taking another man's wife, by taking her interest away from the husband, away from the home, and you keep her with you, you are a dead man. You see, God is serious about sin. And he doesn't measure, he doesn't interpret sin like we human beings interpret sin. He interprets it 
from the notion coming from heaven. He said, Thou art but a dead man, for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, And God said unto him in a dream, Yes, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thine heart. He said, God, I'm righteous. That's what he thought. But the righteous man is going to die the death of a sinner. The man told me, I was working on his information. He told me that this woman was a sister. And I worked on that, yet you worked on a lie. And yet you are going to die because sin a sin. There's no excuse before the Lord. And then it goes on to say, I know that thou didst age in the integrity of thine heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. I stopped you. I protected you. I prevented you from going into that woman because she is a woman of covenant. And the husband is a man of covenant. Even though God protected him, he now told him the truth that this one will kill you and kill your whole family and if you die in that condition i am righteous i am righteous i am saved i'm sanctified i didn't touch her i didn't do anything if you die in that condition god said you die and you will go to a lost eternity i also withheld thee from sinning against me therefore suffered i thee not to touch her and then in verse 7 in verse 7 it says now therefore restore the man his wife for he is a prophet and he shall pray for thee and thou shalt live and if thou restore her not if thou restore her not if you say uh, well from what he told me what have i done wrong if you restore her not if you don't get her back to her husband so that she can be with her husband 100 percent not that you and abraham are sharing her together if you don't restore her you will thou know thou that thou shalt surely die thou and all that are thine thank god the man woke up early in the morning and restored sarah his wife and abraham prayed for him and they did not die i will not die but if you are tossing with another man's wife judgment is coming if you are playing games with another woman's husband, judgment is coming. The Lord preserve us from every form of sin in Jesus' name. We're looking at number two here. Number two, grace, our portion and power over temptation. The grace of God is available. And God has so worked it out that no matter the temptation and no matter the challenge, it will give us abundant grace, enough grace we overcome in Jesus' name. We're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. It says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. That's what the Lord is telling you tonight. My grace is sufficient for thee. His grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The power of Christ will rest upon you. 
the kind of power you have never known will come upon you tonight in Jesus name greater grace and higher grace and deeper grace coming into your life tonight in Jesus name we're looking at Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 we're reading from verse 14 Hebrews chapter 12 reading from verse 14 follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord look at verse 15 15. In verse 15, looking diligently. You see, to overcome temptation, we need to look diligently. Look at our hearts diligently. Look at our minds diligently. Examine our habits diligently. Examine the, the line we're following diligently. Examine the things we've been doing that will land us, will make us weaker will make this temptation stronger. It says diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Let's go to, go to verse 16 there. In verse 16, it tells us, it says, lest, any, lest there be any fornicator, or profane person as Esau. As Esau. Esau didn't understand. He was not watching over his birthright. Esau was not watching against the temptation that might come. All right, you want the lentils? Sell me your birthright. He was not watching. And unfortunately, he so did not have anybody watching over him. The, the mother was not watching over Esau. All the mother was watching over was her dream. The dream she had when she conceived Esau and Jacob. And Isaac was not watching over Esau. All Isaac was watching was the venison that he ate. And because of that, his soul was left unprotected. Who is watching over you? Well, your pastor here ought to be watching over you. But when last, did we cross each other on the way? When last, did you speak to me? When last, did I speak to you? Am I watching over you? Obey, obey them that have the rule over you. For they watch for your soul as they that must give account that they might do it with joy and not with grief. When last did you allow me to watch over you? And while I'm trying to watch over you in preaching and I make the details so clear in my ministry of watching over you, are you not offended? Why is he talking like that? And why is he so clear? Why is he so detailed? I'm doing my work. I'm watching over you. And Esau did not have a father to watch over him, a mother to watch over him. And Jacob, his twin brother, was not watching over him. All Jacob was watching is how I can get that birthright from him. And so, look at him, just left like that. He himself was not watching over himself. No father, no mother, no brother, no pastor, no preacher watching over him. And when the temptation came, okay, sell me your birthright. I said, all right, take it. What am I going to do with the birthright? I'm dying of hunger. In your life, watch. That's how we overcome. In your life, and if you have somebody like me to talk to you and to preach to you and to explain to you and to say, looks like there's carelessness here. Looks like the temptation there. And I'm trying to watch over you and you're shaking your head and you're dodging and you're turning the other way and you don't even want to, you, know, you don't want to say, hello, pastor, uh, this is my life and this is what I'm going through and what we are talking about you know that day you were talking on temptation it's like you knew me and you were talking about me and you surrender yourself so that we can watch over you I pray you will not be lost 
I said you will not be lost. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, when I'm, you know, when I come on, I mention uh, young people, I mention children, I mention youth, I mention choir, I mention almost everybody so that I can watch over you. The people that get offended, uh, uh, what's, what's happening to the pastor this new year, mentioning this and mentioning that, okay, if it's like that, and then uh, they react. When you react like that, you're saying, Pastor, go your way. Read your Bible and preach what you want to preach, but don't apply the Bible to me. You are not watching over me. I don't allow you to watch over me. You'll be like Esau that had nobody watching over him. Come back, come back, come back. If you're still part of the congregation, I'm going to watch over you. I said I'm going to watch over you. If you push me this way, push me that way, I'll say, Father, forgive her, forgive him. He knows not, she knows not what he's doing. Otherwise, how will you push the driver out of the moving vehicle? Otherwise, how will you uh, kind of remove the belt and push the pilot out of the plane? You don't want to die, you will not die. We will keep watching over you. Our pastors will keep watching over you. Our preachers will keep on watching over you. And I hope our preachers will not become so afraid and so timid that we cannot watch over the sheep, the members the Lord has given us. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for a morsel of meat sold is birthright. You will not sell your birthright. We'll come to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at godliness through prayer and perseverance against temptation. Prayer, perseverance against temptation. If we will pray, God will protect us. God will preserve us. And God will deliver us from the tempter in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 41. Matthew chapter 26. We're looking at verse 41. Watch and pray that she enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Is prayer that will then bring up the flesh in strength to match the level of the willingness of the spirit so that temptation and sin will not overcome us, will not overcome you. Tonight, we're going to pray, you're going to pray, and I'm going to pray to you so that all the roots and the directions of temptation in the past tonight will become overcomers in Jesus name and the grace to overcome and the godliness that God will plant in your heart so that you will now from now on resist the devil and you will flee from you the Lord grant unto every one of us tonight in Jesus name let's rise up now and mightily cry unto the Lord and talk to the Lord from the depth of our heart. Appreciate the direct message. Appreciate the direct warning. Appreciate the direct application of the word of God to your heart and to your life. And say, Lord, I need grace. Lord, I need grace, godliness. You are the God who protects, the God who preserves from every form of temptation. Stop seeing and stop giving that wrong statement as if God is tempting me. God is the one enticing me to do evil. You know that's not right. Take that statement off your mouth and say, Lord, I know 
when temptation comes, it's not you, it's Satan, it's the devil, it's Lucifer, it's Mr. Heaven, and he's looking for people that will join him to go to hell. That's why he's bringing the temptation. That's why he's bringing the allurement of the world. That's why he's bringing and presenting what will destroy you. He's presenting the poison as pleasure. Call upon the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I surrender. I submit myself to you. Look at the source of that temptation. Look at the root, the route, the pathway of that temptation as it's coming. And you are telling the Lord, Oh Lord, I recognize that. I realize that. I see that. That's how it comes. Then it weakens your heart, weakens your mind, weakens your life, weakens your resolve. But you want to tell the Lord, Lord, have mercy on me. Thank you, Lord, for giving me a pastor watching over me. As one that will give account, I want to yield to the teaching. I want to yield to the instruction so that he will do it with joy. Not to agree, but that is unprofitable for you. Tell the Lord, surrender yourself to the Lord. And examine the lust of the flesh. Examine the pride of life. Examine all those gadgets, these modern gadgets that you use. And the only week in your Christian life, check up. I promise the Lord. Don't allow the gadgets to take away the Bible from your hand from your heart to take away your devotion to take away your total surrender and submission to the Lord don't allow that and don't allow all the social media news Pornography and those things that attract your attention. Don't allow that to take away your consecration, your soul, and to weaken your commitment to the Lord and your commitment to your home. Examine yourself, whether ye be in the faith. Do you still have the same consecration that you had many years ago? The same response to the word of God that you had many years ago? Do you still have that? The same submission of heart to the word of God that you had many years ago, or are you now judging the message, evaluating the message, classifying the message? That's not why you came. You came so that God can find you out, fish you out. Help you to discover 
where you stand. Yes, I know, but why is he talking like that? I don't want him to talk. I want him to be afraid, to fidget. I want him not to speak out of conviction. How do you want him to talk? Go back to the cross to say, Lord, here I am. I give myself, I surrender myself completely unto you. Let him wash you, let him purge you, let him purify you. Temptation can ruin if you yield to it. Temptation will cause death if you yield to it. It will bring spiritual death, separate you from God. It will bring sad, sorrowful death, sudden death. If you yield to it, and if you don't have a chance to repent before you die, and you keep on with the lying and the lying and the lying and the deception, and pushing away your teacher, pushing away. The leader that will tell you the truth If you die in that condition It will be like Esau Mother not watching over him Only watching over her dream Father not watching over him Only watching the food That Esau will give as a hunter Jacob not watching over him just watching for the birthright. And he too, hunter, 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 not watching over himself. And after all, there is spiritual death. There is the sad, sudden, sorrowful death. There is a second death. Get all the grace you need. God says, My grace is sufficient for you. Get God on your side. That he'll protect you, preserve you every time. But you will not go in the direction of temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Pray. Pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray with faith. Pray with expectation that He'll make you strong. Let him establish you once again in godliness. A godly heart. Godly mind. A godly lifestyle. Free. Free from sin.
I will grant you grace to deliver you. He will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom. Whosoever comes, I will in no wise drive him away. He loves you. He doesn't want you to drown in the ocean of temptation. Love yourself too. And tell the Lord, in your love, protect me. Don't listen to the lies of other people. Abimelech, listen to the lie of Abraham. To the lie of Sarah. He is my brother. She is my sister. And then Abimelech took her. Don't listen to the lies of people. I just like you. I don't have any intention. Don't listen to their lies. Be holy. Your heart. Your thought. Your mind. Be holy. Without holiness. No man shall see the Lord. You want to see the Lord, don't you? That's why you came. You want to get to heaven. That's why you came. Even the righteous man, the righteous minister has to smite you. That will be oil. That will be joy for you. Even if we have to drag you to heaven, that will be joy for you. Surrender to the mercy, to the word. And say, Lord, do whatever you have to do to make me holy, to preserve me in holiness so that when the trumpet shall sound, I will not be left behind. He answers prayer when you seek him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He gives grace, more grace, more grace. When you seek him in honesty, faithfully seeking all the grace you need, to lead to please him. Watch and pray. Not only really prayer, watch. Watch and pray. And if your local pastor is watching over you, accept. Don't isolate yourself. And if your GS is watching over you, accept. Don't dodge the message. Don't act as if I'm all right. Give the chance to watch over you.
In Jesus' name we pray. Have you prayed? I said, have you prayed? God has answered your prayer. More grace in Jesus' name. More strength in Jesus' name. More vigilance in Jesus' name. The Lord protect you. The Lord preserve you. The Lord perfect whatever is lacking in your life in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for making it so plain that anyone hearing can read, can hear, and run. Lord, we thank you for your love and revealing your mind, your heart unto us as to the source of temptation, as to the ruinousness of temptation. And as to the grace and the power made available so that we can overcome. Lord, I pray new strength, new power, more grace, abundant life will come to every one of us. Make us overcome in Jesus' name. And for those who have trudged the path of hide and seek for such a long time and no pastor now is allowed to watch over them no leader no preacher is allowed to watch over them lord recover everyone to the path of restoration and righteousness in jesus name all the pranks and all the satanic method that will shield themselves away from the leader, from the pastor, from their overseer, from the general superintendent, so that nobody is watching over them and they want to be lost in the wilderness of temptation and sin. Lord, recover everyone in Jesus' name. And the pastors have become so fearful, so timid, and they fret and fidget, and they cannot even talk to members anymore. They cannot watch over members anymore. They cannot watch over the youth, over the adult, over the workers, full time or part time, because they have been told, stay away. I don't want any, anybody watching over me. Oh Lord, I pray, all those on scriptural attitudes, cancel in our church in Jesus' name. The boldness and conviction of a true shepherd grant unto all our leaders and the submission and the absolute surrender of the sheep in the fold grant to all the members in Jesus name those who are falling lift them up those who are backsliding restore them those who are weak strengthen them and those who are at the verge of backsliding, hold them and pull them back in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray everyone that has become an Esau, only watching for material things and the spiritual life is gone. Oh Lord, restore, recover every Esau today in Jesus' name. Anointing that breaks every yoke. Break every yoke in every life in Jesus' name. That entrenched disobedience of the word of God, O oh Lord, uproot it from every heart in Jesus' name. And Lord, raise us up and lift us up so that we can walk in righteousness, in holiness every moment, every day for the rest of our lives in Jesus' name. Confirm the truth in every life. Confirm the grace in every life. Confirm your protecting power in every life in Jesus' name. We're going back home in victory. We're going back home with trial. 
and we are more than conquerors, everyone, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.